Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Katie Warner from Art Centre Melbourne, and welcome to our special top class teacher PD this afternoon, all about the drama solo with Ellie and Marg. I'm just going to admit another person. A little, just some very quick housekeeping. If everyone could please make sure that they keep their cameras off and their microphones on mute as we will be recording this session and making it available on YouTube in term two. Before I hand over to Ellie and Mark, I would just like to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you so much for making the time to be with us today. I'm going to turn my, I'm going to put myself on mute. I'm going to turn my camera off. I'm going to enjoy this conversation. Over to you, Mark. Hello, everybody, and hi, Ellie, as well. So uh, it's great to uh, have this opportunity to speak to uh, to, to teachers about the the best uh, the the way that you can can deal with with the, the solos and uh, get the most out of uh, the experience for your students to deal with the, this really important part of the curriculum. And uh, we're, we're gearing up, of course, to have the, the, um, these published in uh, early in term two. Uh, so you'll have the exam for this coming year. Um, but there's loads of ways that you can approach that learning and that experience with students. And I'm not the person to tell you that because you're the ones in the classroom and Ellie is going to be the one to perhaps, I'm going to ask him to, uh, to share some of the handy tips, you know, that you might have. First of all, what, what happens, you know, when you first get to see these in, in any printed examination in the publication what do you do uh, well I usually make my students um, aware as soon as they're published that they've they've come out and to have a quick read and have a quick look through them but um, usually start of term two we're, we're so busy with the ensemble performance uh, and working towards that end goal that um, we don't have a lot of time in class to to actually investigate them um, in any way, shape or form. And it's not until after their mini solo task that we, uh, unit four outcome one, um, until after we've finished that, that we actually get to explore these um, solo performance structures in any depth. Um, usually around the time that they're published though, the students are um, already dibsing which ones that they're keen to explore further. Um, so I, I hear about it uh, at lunch times and at recesses rather than in class time, but the, the sorts of um, solo performances that they're, the prescribed structures that they're most keen to, to pursue. Uh, and I don't know about other um, drama classes, but I, I do believe that it, it's quite often the case that um, despite the fact that there are thousands of students across Victoria doing all the structures, that inside the classroom of, of you know, certain drama schools, um, that uh, a student decides, that's mine, you can't do that one. And I try to uh, encourage them to, to share and to, um, to be aware that you know there are students across the state that are going to be doing one of these 10 solo structures so it doesn't belong to you um, and and the first thing that i get them to do after they've um finished their ensemble is uh, a, a little exercise i call sell my structure and that's basically um, a PowerPoint presentation that the students create and, and present to their peers um, that really explores in a little bit more detail some of the stimulus material um, from one of the solo structures uh, and the dramatic potential for that particular structure. Um, and usually they choose the one that they're most keen or the, the two or three. Um, I've only got a small class of four this year. So, um, you know, that they would choose two or three and uh, they would present that um, in, in um, to usually within the last two weeks of term two. Um, 
And that's really the, the kick-starting point for many of the students. They, they watch these PowerPoint presentations and they get very excited and enthused about um, which one best suits them and their skill base. Uh, and that's sometimes based on the um, performance style. Um, if there's, you know, a musical theatre option, there might be a student in the group that feels that they feel, you know, particularly confident with voice and dance, and that's something that might excite them. Um, it might be, um, you know, uh, the, the potential for comedy in, in another solo structure that uh, another student might feel excited about it. Um, they, they have a, a, an aptitude for caricature or comedy um, and comic timing. So uh, that's usually a, a great determiner in, in just helping students decide which solo structure best suits them. Um, and then um, towards the end of the term, you know, usually in the last week, the students have made a solid choice. Um, usually it's down to one solo structure or possibly two that they're, they're going to go away and explore further. Uh, and I send them away with a little homework task over the term break. Uh, I call it the solo worksheet. And um, there are various um, uh, incarnations of the solo performance worksheet. Drama Victoria have one, I know, on their website. Um, uh, if there are teachers that are keen and, and interested, I'm very happy to share the one that I use with them. Um, they can just email me at e-r-e-z-e -E at bialik, b-i-a-l-i-k dot vic dot edu dot au and I can um, send them or forward that um, as, a, as a starting point. And it's really just a way of um, uh, a, a way of collecting the research that the students um, gain from investigating that stimulus material. So they explore that in quite a bit of depth and look at, you know, production areas that might relate to the structure. They could maybe investigate um, uh, characters that um, connect with the central character. There's lots and lots of um, questions that the solo worksheet asks the students to explore. And that that's allows me to see the depth of their research at the start of their term two and, uh, and a way of, um, you know, propelling the, the, um, the process of getting the students enthused and excited and, um, you know, have a, a foundation from which we can springboard for uh, the weeks to come in term, term three. How much do you give them uh, about the, the kind of the rules and regulations around around the actual performance, or do you start really with just the the um, the all of the the resource material and things? Uh, I tend to uh, approach it from the perspective of an artist and I think artists don't like rules and regulations um, so I, I try to keep those um, you know notes for teachers students um, that's something that we have to explore but let them get excited about the artistry and the creation of, of, of a solo performance first um, and then go into the detail of you know what they can and can't do because um, that kind of tends to stifle the process but I do you know um, get them to have a quick read through of the first four pages of that document um, because I you know that they need to understand that they can't have open flame or weapons or you know anything that that might um, cause uh, alarm bells to ring in the assessor's ears. Um, so, so I try and get them to have a quick read through, but, uh, you know, we don't really go into the detail of that document until we get back in term three. That sounds like a, a really <laughs> sensitive and uh, sensible way of, of approaching it with students. And from a, from a teacher's perspective, um, the teachers that I speak to sometimes who have questions haven't kind of realised perhaps how much 
uh, detail is provided in those first few pages of the exam. So that's really not for your students, but for you to really, uh, if you haven't, um, particularly if you haven't explored those before, to have a look at those. And I think usually the criteria for assessment are published with them and that sort of thing as well. And it's just a good reminder. But from my point of view, I'd love to say, also, don't forget to go back to the study design and just have a little look at the key knowledge and key skills that are form the basis of that. So, I don't know, Ella, would you like to comment on, on that sort of aspect of things? Absolutely. My, my dog's just being a little bit naughty, so I will That's close good. the door. So, while Ellie's closing the door, I'll say, uh, so the, the key knowledge, the key skills, when um, the neighbours drive really past or walk past or the mailman arrives, uh, <laughs> my dog tends to, to uh, want to party. <laughs> um, oh. Yes, look, I agree absolutely. 99% um, uh, of the, the questions that are asked uh, on the um, drama, um, the, the various web pages on Drama Victoria um, and to you, Marg, I know, um, are already answered in those first four pages quite often. Um, so it, it is really important that teachers and students um, arm themselves and read carefully. And the key skills and knowledge, as you mentioned, um, that really is um, the core of the work that the students are producing. And, and you would see that when you're looking at those pages, one of the most important um, pieces of information is the assessment criteria. And I think for students to achieve um, success with this exam, they need to start thinking like examiners. And the key skills and the key knowledge from the, the study design um, have a direct connection to the assessment criteria. So if you have a, a really strong understanding of what it is that Unit 4 Outcome 2 requires in terms of the key skills and knowledge, and you look directly at that assessment criteria, and you know that fully and, and feel confident um, you know, as you're preparing your, your solo performance exam, um, I'm speak, speaking directly to the students here, then, then you have the greatest chance, opportunity for success. Yeah, so uh, there's, that's kind of the background information. So now we, we get all of that background, right? You've got your students, you, they're, you, they're, they're kind of inspired to, about something. They're, they've gone off and they've done their, they've made, almost made their decisions pretty much at this early in term three then. Um, yes. they're, and they're out and off and running. So. How do you keep them running? <laughs> <laughs> I generally try to use the playmaking techniques as a way of structuring um, each week of my, my rehearsals with my students. So um, in the first week um, of term three, I would get them, you know, really heavily into the brainstorming, all the research that they've collected um, and start to explore how that might look or be shaped into a, some sort of storyboard. Um, and, you know, that process might take the entire seven weeks because we might struggle with how we're going to piece and shape it together. And it might not be in any completed form, but at least it's, it's um, you know, a starting point, if you like. Um, and it's not by any um, stretch of the imagination um, you know, once we move on to week two and we begin the improvisation process, that we won't go back to the storyboarding or the, or the researching. But um, it, it helps me and my students um, create a, 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 a structure for the lessons, if that makes sense. Um, so, you know, we might hit a... a, a Oops. I'm not sure if you're hearing me, but... I think we've got some frozen screen there. Looks like Ellie's frozen to me. In week two when we're improvising. Uh, uh, oh. Uh, can you are you freezing? Oh, I, I, I feel completely frozen. unfrozen. <laughs> it's quite warm in my, my house. Am uh, I okay? To, to um, I'm hearing going? you now. I'm not sure if anybody else is uh, 
uh, what, what everybody else is experiencing. So uh, I guess we continue. So, um, <laughs> So basically each week I, I set a, a focus and the focus is one of the playmaking techniques as we build and shape their performances um, in readiness for presentation. And, uh, you know, I move through um, the playmaking techniques, but that it is a fluid movement and sometimes we're going back to researching um, or storyboarding as we move through the other playmaking techniques. So week two is usually improvisation, week three is scripting, week four is editing, week five is refining. Um, and, you know, as we move through these processes, we get to a presentation stage. Um, but, you know, sometimes we pull it apart and put it back together in, in different ways um, so that we can, you know, um, edit and, and fine tune and refine the performance as we move through. It must be very different in different classroom settings with the number of students that you have and how you might work. Uh, I know that um, in my experience as a music teacher, uh, other teachers in the school were a little bit sort of mystified as to how you have students doing so many different things, very different things simultaneously. How much do the students, do you use your, the students working with each other to develop these things? That's a great question, Mark. Um, I, I really believe that it is um, a team effort and they've um, created a chemistry usually um, at the end of their ensemble performance process and the solo performance can be extremely daunting and terrifying um, so I try to demystify that or try to make it less daunting by um, allowing the students to collaborate uh, quite extensively so that's not just in show and tell presentation stuff but um, in the creation of the work so we might um, have uh, you know an idea um, that we brainstormed um, or storyboarded um, and it might involve the central character talking to the imagined audience whoever that might be as, as specified in the prescribed structure, and that um, the other students might be playing that implied audience. And then there could be interaction with that character and the implied audience. So the implied audience could then ask questions to the central character or react to that central character. So it allows for students to um, to, to have real input into each other's solo performance making. And that must really help as you get nearer to the time because they will be invested in giving each other the best advice and so on as they uh, refine their work. Maybe Absolutely. You could talk, yeah, well, perhaps you could talk about how you do get that, you know, that performance ready kind of feeling. <laughs> sure. Well, there's a, a lot of work, a lot of time that goes into, you know, that refining process you mentioned. Um, but we generally like to um, uh, create lots of opportunities for students to present the work um, to, to multiple audiences and usually in an unfinished um, uh, form. So, I don't want students to ever feel that, you know, the performance is actually completed until their, their actual performance in front of the examiners. And even then, it's, you know, there might be a presentation to parents or family after that presentation as well, um, so that they do uh, quite, quite a bit of um, showcasing the work that they present and it might be you know just the first minute or the opening scene or the closing scene um, in fact that's usually my starting point mark i i love the students to really think of what is it that's going to happen at the beginning of the performance and usually that's quite prescribed by the the structure itself um, but what might happen in that opening sequence that could be um, exciting and visceral for the audience. Uh, and I push the students to think about starting with action rather than a talking head. What is the action that could take place 
in that opening scene or the implied action. So, um, you know, it might be a 15 second, no, um, no lines or dialogue, just um, the character getting to, to the point where it's, it's about to talk to the audience. Um, and, and what is that opening scene that might set the context? Um, you know, is the character um, climbing a mountain or, um, you know, uh, about to have a car accident? Or what is it that's going to excite and entice the audience to sit at the edge of their chairs and think, oh, this is, this is something exciting? And what is the end point? What is the, the perhaps um, the, the dramatic turnaround that happens at the end of the performance? Where do you want to take your audience to? Um, and then, you know, that whole middle section is, um, is just a, a case of, you know, how do we get from this point to this point? Yeah, look, it's a very interesting. I think it came down to those sort of three words that are mentioned a couple of times in those opening, you know, pages of rules and all that sort of stuff. And uh, it kind of helped me to understand what the drama solo task was all about in the first place when it, when it was new to me. And that was show, don't tell. I think yes, it says. Yes. And, and I just find like that really and useful. And every year they um, they produce the examiner's reports and you see again and again the chief examiner talking about um, the students uh, who, who did particularly well um, versus the students who didn't. And it, it boils down to that, doesn't it? It's, it's a, the fact that in many instances the students um, tell and don't show and, and don't reap the rewards as a result or vice versa, show and don't tell, um, or, or show it rather than tell it, um, and and reap the rewards of that uh, that investment. And I think that's something that we can see with the top class performances. Uh, you know, when we when we have a look at those, and I guess that how how do you, do your students watch those, and how would you use the top class performances in your or the, the uh, that sort of thing in your teaching? Well, one of the things that we did this year um, and we've done in previous years is uh, we sit down and we, we, we determine or we try to determine what is the linking factor between all the top class solo performances that they can identify. So um, we first start by going um, through each of the, the top class performances and we write down a list of the things that we thought were particularly effective um, about each of those performances. And then we try and determine, well, what is it that is, you know, particularly noteworthy about all those performances and what links or connections could they make um, and often we see that the students identify work that is extremely well researched that it's not just the stimulus material that these students have investigated they have gone into great um, lengths to find really insightful information about the character that they're presenting uh, and and they've gone well beyond the, the structure itself in terms of the research that they've collected. But they've also been very, um, in most instances, they've been incredibly uh, perceptive about what details they want to include in their performance. So they've edited out all the extraneous stuff and they're focused on only what is absolutely essential to the telling of their story. And, and that's particularly you know, useful to see. Um, the students often recognise that when um, they see these performances, they're, they're seeing work by students who have masterful skills in, in uh, presenting their expressive skills. So they know how to manipulate voice and movement and gesture and facial expression at a really high level to, um, to, to create very distinct characters and that you know sometimes 
the characters will return multiple times throughout the solo performance. And you can identify each character very, very uh, quickly because the, the expressive skills are so consistently applied. Um, the other things that they, they identified were masterful use of production areas, that um, there's such wonderful um, sense of, you know, costuming or set piece or prop piece that is used in very clever and exciting ways, often to transform um, either the space or allow the actor to transform character effectively. Um, so really masterful ways of using um, production areas um, and often in ways that will um, illustrate the, the application of symbol. So um, very, very useful and clever ways of, of using the production areas. Um, I think they were the main factors, but there's probably so many more. With the production areas, um, I suppose there's, there could be, um, there could be a temptation to say, oh, I think I could use this and I could use that. Have you got a, a bit of a sense of how, how do you kind of limit things to the essentials <laughs> or get students to understand that, you know, that there isn't necessarily, there's a time factor here and there's all sorts yes. of other things. So maybe yes. let's talk about those practicalities. Usually the first incarnation of their solo performance is 48 minutes. <laughs> uh, it's it's a, a painful process of editing. Um, and for the for many students, they just they have to learn that it's okay to kill your babies. And, and it's really hard because they've worked, you know, they've discovered something, they've found um, I, I call it the eureka moments, you know, when you're inside the rehearsal room and, and or, or even, you know, they're doing a presentation and they discover something that's unique and wonderful. And, and it's like, a, you know, it was a piece of coal, but it's been shaped into a diamond. But um, there's many diamonds that have to get left by the wayside as you, you know, slowly craft your performance to seven minutes. Um, and, and understanding that that seven minutes is, um, is non-negotiable, that, that it is something that the assessor's time. And if you do go over that seven minutes, it, it's quite frightening because, you know, if climax is your, your dramatic element that you've been working towards and you don't actually get to show that climactic point at the end of your performance, how it can impact significantly all your um, assessment criteria. So it's really important to, um, you know, to, to not be too precious throughout the process and to let, let things go. Perhaps we could spend a little time talking about that whole getting ready for the actual situation of the exam. So although the, the sorts of things that you've just touched on, but also what does that mean? You find out, you'll find out in early August, I think, is when you find out dates and places of assessment how do you, how does that impact on students and how do you get them ready for the date well obviously there's that statement of intention um, that they really must um, you know spend a little bit of time on and they've only got 100 words to explain you know some some really crucial points about their their performance and their interpretation of their structure um, it's really important that they, you know, spend a little bit of time, um, you know, preparing that document and um, working with their teacher to decide what is essential for the assessors to know and what is perhaps already explicit in the prescribed structure itself and, and not repeating that prescribed structure. Um, I always think it's great to, you know, give a little bit of detail um, in dot point form about each of the, the dot points they have to cover. So if the dot point one is examples of, um, what are the examples that they have selected from their research? And just, you know, putting it in, in dot point form, dot point one equals dot, 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 and dot. Yeah, so. 
so that's the sort of thing that helps to focus assessors' attention on the things that are trying to be shown, I imagine. I think we've lost Ellie again. Uh, he's frozen in space. Uh, hopefully, Odo's still there, looking, looking like he's still there. Um, I guess from, uh, from the curriculum side of things, you would be spending time. I think one of the things that I really enjoy is being able to uh, to enjoy the actual performance. Uh, he's disappeared completely. Hopefully, he's going to come back to us. Um, yeah. So, uh, being ready, performance ready, getting getting ready for for any performance is uh, similar. I think you know the um, the opportunity to have. Uh, I really liked so that sort of Renaissance idea of um, uh, decorum, uh, knowing what it is that you have to do really well, feeling very organised, the decorum. And once you're really very organised, you've got everything planned to the, you know, as, as you can plan it, then you have the opportunity to um, what they, I think the in Renaissance times, the musicians certainly did, called it sprezzatura, um, that noble negligence, I think they called it, you know, where you kind of can break the rules because you know exactly what your um, essential bits are and you've got a little bit of freedom within yourself. So, um, yeah, so we've got a little bit of uh, an opportunity for sprezzatura, for, for exploring it. And if all of those things work, beautifully, then uh, you would have that very special moment of grazia, that's the grace of performance when everything just goes right. So we're back, Ellie. Hooray, I've just been... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, it feels like the internet's conspiring against me. Um, so where was I? We were preparing for the examinations. Of course we were. Yeah. Yes. So uh, definitely um, the statement of intention is an important one to consider. I think the, the other thing that I, my top tip that I would give teachers is to tell their teachers, don't be frightened or, or tell their students, don't be frightened to make direct eye contact connection with the assessors. Um, it is implicit in the structures that the character is talking to a specific audience. And, and I think it's great when students break that fourth wall and connect with the assessors as if they were that intended audience. Um, and a lot of students are, are quietly terrified um, to do that and will, you know, often hug the back area of the performance space um, without making any connection with with their or engaging with their audience and I think it's um, often telling that they haven't had um, perhaps enough performance opportunities to do that um, and the other um, top tip and I know it sounds ridiculously um, uh, simple but um, get your students to practice presenting their performance um, under examination conditions. Um, and by that I mean, um, get your students to understand that there is no applause after the performance and what it feels like to actually have to move your set and props into the performance space, actually set that up within a one minute time frame and pull it out again in another one minute time frame. We, we know that they have a little bit more um, you know, they've got 10 minutes in the room, um, they've got about a minute and a half to set up and, and, and strike, but that process can be daunting if they've only done it a couple of times before they enter the examination room. So um, really important, particularly if they've got some large items that they need to, to practice the, you know, construction of. Great, yeah. So I... Uh we've covered a fair bit of territory here and I don't know if there are other questions. Some of the questions that I have um, have had in over the you know in the past couple of years would be about um, how how do you 
handle, you know, when, when a student needs uh, spurs or a whip, you know, can the character, uh, you know, when you can't have weapons? Yeah, I think uh, teachers and students have been very imaginative and creative where, you know, the, the reference might be a gun or a knife. Um, students have, have become very clever in the way they're going to approach that, understanding that it is examination rules and they cannot bring anything into that assessment room that could be considered a weapon. And even if it is a um, obvious uh, toy gun, um, it's just not permitted. So the students need to make um, very considered uh, um, solutions. A whip could easily be replaced with a rope or a you know something that that creates the quality of movement that a whip would do without it being a weapon um, and of course we cannot damage the the examination center in any way shape or form so you know spurs may cause uh, problems on surfaces floors etc and they are potentially dangerous so you know the, the students have worked out clever ways of, um, you know, uh, making stagecraft choices that allow us, uh, sorry, production area choices that allow us to see perhaps what is not there. Um, you know, I'm thinking of the, um, uh, the solo performance structure from last year, from 2020, um, the, the um, cowboy characters would walk in and you'd hear the sound design of the spurs rattling as they moved across the space with each step. And it was beautifully timed to their soundscape. Um, they didn't need to wear spurs. They, they created the illusion that they were wearing them. Yeah, so it really is using all of the the um, your own physicality, your own in, in creativity, and the the um, possible production areas that might support your decisions. Mm -hmm. Then, so um, and do you have to use all of the stimulus material? Do you have to? Is that or does it have to be obvious that you? The stimulus material, um, you know, often uh, is a catalyst for their research and um, certainly you can't use all of it. Uh, you, you'd need a performance that lasts right. 48 minutes in order to get through all of the stimulus material. So you have to make very crafted choices about what aspects of the stimulus material is specifically relevant to the structure. and. And by no means is the stimulus material the end goal of, of your research. Um, it's, I think, the starting point, and you need to go way further down that well. Um, it's the fuel. It's, it's the stuff that sustains the actor in, in moving through this 12-week process, 14-week process, um, in order to get to a, a performance that's solo performance ready. So. You want to go deep, deep down. You want to find and investigate everything and then choose what is absolutely relevant. Um, and that's, you know, through the editing and refining process. So it sounds like editing is, you know, ditching your best, you know, half your best ideas <laughs> is what, what's going to be uh, an important aspect of uh, that sort of preparation time. We've only got a few minutes left. Is there anything else that you would like to, to say about getting students to that next level, you know? In uh, I feel like I could talk for hours, Mark, and, and uh, maybe it's a, a, a little bit of time, if we've got a few minutes, that maybe we could ask um, any of the listeners if they've got uh, a, a question that they want to put into the chat. We've got about four minutes left, so if there's any, <laughs> if there's a quick question that anybody wants to put in the chat, go go for it. Um, it's been very interesting to hear how you do these, uh, how you how you do approach uh, what I see as um, the culmination of our of a, the study design when the exam gets published, and I see these these um, structures on paper and imagine them going out into the into the schools of Victoria and 
students actually having going through this process. It's wonderful. There is a question. Is it okay? I've just seen it. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Mel. <laughs> is it okay for production areas props to sit dormant until a specific traumatic moment? Um, I say yes and no. Um, so uh, I would argue that you want to to use whatever it is that you bring in into the performance space in creative and exciting and wonderful ways. We see time and time again those amazing students at the top class concerts and you know it's just a simple hula hoop but who would have thought the 50,000 different ingenious ways that they could use a hula hoop to bring to life this performance solo structure. Um, I say that, but at the same time I say, I think the most exciting thing is when there is an element of surprise, where there is something that I wasn't expecting to happen in the solo performance. So, you know, a, a, a piece of a costume that opens up to reveal something, or a prop that you know dismantles to become something or you know I talk about that end moment in the solo performance as being specifically um, you know uh, something that we begin with um, often and that you know isn't it wonderful if you can actually bring about through the seven minute performance that the set piece or the prop piece comes together to form the the quintessential symbol that you want the audience to, to walk away with or the feeling or the, the the theme that you're exploring in your solo performance. So um, it it's quite okay for uh, something to lie dormant in order for um, us to be surprised by it um, at the end of the seven minute performance. There's another quick question there from Leah. Thanks, uh, Ellie, if you can see that one. Yeah. Um, how do you help your students select their chosen dramatic element? Um, well, of course, all the dramatic elements are going to be there within the performance, but you want to choose a dramatic element or help your students choose a dramatic element that's going to help progress their performance. And there's no easy solution to this one. Um, you know, I, I think there are some inherently um, structures that, that scream out rhythm to me. Um, I'm trying to think of an example and I can't for the life of me at the moment, but um, you know, if we looked at the stage parent from last year and the fact that you know, um, there's rhythm in tap dancing, there's rhythm in you know, um, musical theater, there's rhythm in poetry, um, there's rhythm in rap. So looking at ways that you might um, explore rhythm um, in lots and lots of exciting ways. But I think it's really important to go back to the study design, look at what is the meaning of each of those dramatic elements and get the students to really investigate um, the 40,000 different ways that they could present that particular dramatic element. So if it is conflict, how can you show conflict internal, conflict with other characters, conflict with your environment. So you're, you're not thinking of conflict just in a one dimensional fashion, but you're also thinking about how it might weave into each and every scene so that it's consistently and coherently applied. That's great. Um, and there's one quick one there to would yes. your students select this early. Would most of your students select this early on or see what is evolving as the performance develops and then refine this choice? Both and, and either is it completely acceptable. I do get them to, as soon as they get their solo um, worksheet, to actually stipulate um, a dramatic element or dramatic elements and actually outline in that document um, when we hit the ground running in the first week of term three and start brainstorming, um, I will often question the dramatic element choice that the student has has put down or choices because they sometimes they pick more than one. Well, thank you. And um, it's been great chatting to you. I think we're about one minute over. Um, <laughs> So, Sorry. Not too bad. <laughs> I'm not sure if Katie's coming back. Yes, she is. 
Bye. <laughs> Thank you both so much. That was just wonderful. And Marg, some of the best improv I've ever seen, <laughs> keeping that conversation going when we lost Ellie there. Oh, I'm so <laughs> sorry about that. It's not your fault at all. It's, it's the joy of Zoom. Um, and hopefully soon we'll be doing these in real life. Um, thank you both so much um, for your time and your expert advice and tips and ideas. And I know lots of teachers will probably be shooting you an email. Um, that's hey, really generous welcome. of you, Ellie. Thank you so much. Thank and, you. And of course, you're also very welcome to be emailing me with questions. I don't want to put you off asking questions, but uh, yeah, you're always, always uh, welcome to contact the VCAA. That's Thanks. lovely, Marg. Thank you so much. So I'll say farewell for now, everybody, and we'll get this up on YouTube uh, in term two so people can have a look at it at their leisure. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Have a lovely night. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>